So I encourage you to look at that if uh, you were curious. And also the uh, Henry's notes for the lecture right now are also online. So I'll put links to both of those things in the chat. Henry, please, uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, you're muted. Hi. So what we'll talk about today is basically a transition from discrete uh, spaces like binary error correcting codes to continuous spaces like RM. And so to begin with, let's review where we were. So what is the linear programming bound for binary codes with a given minimal distance? Remember from last time that we write it in terms of the uh, distance distribution AI. So we're trying to, min to maximize the total number of points. In other words, the sum of all the AIs subject to having A0 equal to one, AI greater than or equal to zero, all of the counts before the minimum distance vanishing, and also the Delsard inequalities. So here, this does not necessarily give the best possible code. There's no reason to think that uh, the optimum here is actually achieved by a code, but it at least gives some bound for how good a code can possibly be because every code satisfies these inequalities. So what it's really useful to do here is to take the dual linear program. This is something that's come up in some of the other talks here. Let's just work our way through it in a slightly ad hoc way because basically there are two ways to compute duals of optimization problems. There's the systematic way where you write it in a standard form and transform it. And then there's the way where you just think through what you've got to do when it all works out because you do the right thing. And let's do that here. So what we would like to do with the dual is to get an upper bound on how big the sum of the AIs could be by taking linear combinations of the Delsard inequalities. So here, what I've written in the middle is we've got the Delsard uh, sum of kj of i times ai, and we're going to take some linear combination of that with coefficient cj. And what we're going to do is we're going to get from that an upper bound on uh, the sum of the ais, that's the j equals zero term, as long as the cjs are all non-negative. So basically, this is telling us we can get an upper bound for what we want as long as we take non-negative linear combinations of the Delsard inequalities. And now we can interchange the i and j sums. And what that amounts to saying is we get an upper bound for what we want, the sum of the AIs, in terms of the sum of the AIs weighted by these sums. So here it's convenient to give a name to these sums. Let's say f of i is the sum of the Kravchuk polynomials weighted by the coefficient cj. So in other words, what we've got up here at the top is just an expansion of a polynomial f in terms of the Kravchuk polynomials. And here, remember, kj has degree j. So any set of polynomials, one of each degree, forms a basis for all the polynomials. And so what we've just got is an unconventional basis for polynomials of degree at most n. So the claim is, if you write things this way, then our previous inequality amounts to saying that the sum of ai times f of i is greater than or equal to what we want, as long as the coefficients are non-negative. So now there's only one irritating thing that we wanted an upper bound for the right-hand side. We got the left-hand side. The problem is the left-hand side looks even more complicated than the right-hand side. It's not at all obvious that we've helped anything by saying, oh, we wanted to bound the sum of the AIs. Now we've got the sum of the AIs times f of i. The problem is we've still got the same number of terms we originally had, plus now we've got stupid f of i coefficients. What helps us here is now we can choose the properties of f of i to try to bound this from above. 
So we want to know how big this can get, and we're allowed to put additional properties on f of i to help us. So the i equals zero term, we just get f of zero because we know what a zero is. The terms up to d minus one, we don't need to worry about because ai vanished there. There are no short, there are no nearby code words in the code. All we have to worry about is what happens when i is from d to n. And here we can get an upper bound from this if we can drop those terms. And we can drop those terms if f of i is less than or equal to zero. And this in fact gives us the exact dual LP. That sort of the moral of the story here is dualizing a linear program doesn't involve anything sophisticated. It just amounts to looking at it and saying, what's the simplest thing I can possibly do? And then doing that. So what we end up with is the following theorem. So the theorem says, suppose you've got any polynomial f, which we can write in terms of the Kravchuk polynomials. And let's suppose all the coefficients are non-zero. And just to avoid degeneracy, let's suppose the constant term is strictly positive. And on the other side, let's suppose f is non-positive all the way from d to m. So then what this argument shows is every code with minimal distance, at least d, is bounded above in size by f of 0 divided by the constant term. And so basically, this just amounts to recording what we got from the previous calculations. And in fact, this is the LP dual. And that means strong LP duality says that this achieves the optimal LP bound. In other words, any true bound that can be deduced from the linear program can be instantiated by finding a specific certificate F that uh, proves it. So here, f from a coding theory point of view is a kind of weird object. It's not quite clear what it means conceptually. However, we can think of it as basically a certificate for this bound, that f is an object that tells us that this bound must be true. Any questions about anything so far? Uh, just checking on terminology, does certificate have a specific uh, technical meaning or? Nope. So here I just mean something where uh, if you take a look at it and verify some properties, you can deduce the bound. Okay, thank you. So here, part of what's nice about having a certificate like this is you might think, oh, linear programming bounds are kind of inconvenient because sure, you can solve the linear programming bound, but do you have to solve it from scratch every time you want to know what the answer is? And what the dual is saying is, no, you don't have to solve it from scratch, that once you've solved it, you can simply tell somebody the optimal dual vector, here the optimal auxiliary function f, and then they can check that it works and see that you found the optimum without uh, actually having to resolve it from scratch themselves. So you can think of it as a labor-saving device. So the big question here is how do you choose the optimal polynomial f to obtain the best bound? And humanity has largely failed at this. It's kind of sad. In any given case, we can do it just by solving the LP. However, we don't know how to write it down in general. And there's basically only one good idea anyone's ever had, namely a trick based on the Christoffel Darboux formula that originated in a paper of Mills, Rodemick, Remsey, and Welch in the 70s and has been used by lots of people since then. It works remarkably well, but it doesn't optimize this in every case, and we don't know a general solution. So this problem of, you know, how do you choose f satisfying these constraints to optimize this bound remains unsolved in general. And we also don't know when the linear programming bound can be sharp. We don't know in principle when we should expect there to be a code that matches it and when 
it'll just be some bound, but not a sharp bound. We expect that it'll be pretty rare to get an optimal code matching the bound, but nobody actually knows for sure. So when can you possibly get a sharp bound? The only way you can get a sharp bound is when you go through the proof that we just did, every inequality must involve no loss. So that says two things. That first of all, remember the inequality on F was used to throw away certain terms. And in order to get a sharp bound, we cannot have thrown away any term that was actually positive. So what that means here is the bound can only be sharp if F actually vanishes whenever AI is greater than zero, except for the I equals zero case. And on the other side, it's saying that in order to get a sharp bound, we must not have been making use of any non-sharp inequality. In other words, any inequality that's not actually achieving a sharp bound, anything that's strictly positive, must not have been used in our linear combination. So basically looking at this, we can characterize exactly when you can get a sharp bound, namely don't do anything non-sharp. This is the phenomenon of complementary slackness in linear programming more generally. However, it's not quite clear what to make of this because it gives us a characterization, but it's still not at all obvious when there should be a code that matches up with this characterization. So sort of general optimization theory says some very valuable things. It's not quite clear what to make of them though. Questions about anything so far? Okay, so let's look at an example where it's sharp. Uh, sorry, a and, question just came oh, in uh, on the forum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, how about considering the infimum of positive definite function spaces to get an upper bounds for the LP? So relation between SDP and LP. Mm. So one thing is, so like this question is pointing out, SDP bounds are potentially better than this. And so in particular, the LP bound isn't just existing in isolation, but it's part of a family, the Lasser hierarchy say, of increasingly good bounds. And that's true. We also don't know how to optimize these things except in specific cases that in general, there's this whole hierarchy of bounds, none of which we know how to uh, analyze exactly. But this is a very valuable perspective on things. So let's look at the extended binary Golay code. You don't need to know what it is. It's a really beautiful code, though. Let me tell you a few facts about it. It's got block length 24. In other words, every, every vector is made up of 24 bits. It's no coincidence that this is like the leech lattice. It's got minimum distance 8. And it's the best possible code with these parameters. It turns out to be a linear code mod 2 of dimension 12. So there are 4,096 code words. And the distance distribution works out quite beautifully. It's got 759 neighbors at distance 8 of each point, 2576 at distance 12, and then it's symmetrical, 75, 759 at distance 16, and one that's simply the opposite code word, switching zeros and ones, while all the other parts of the distance distribution vanish. Incidentally, if you like uh, VIT designs, 759 will look familiar, and that's not a coincidence. So how can we possibly get a sharp bound here? So let's think about this in the most simple-minded way that you possibly could. We're looking for some polynomial f. And we want this polynomial to start out positive, but it should turn non-positive at 8. And it should be less than or equal to 0 from 8 to 24, while being equal to 0 at the points 8, 12, 16, and 24 because those are the places where AI is positive. 
So what's the simplest thing you could possibly do? The simplest thing you could possibly do is say, let's start positive. Let's have a root at eight. Then let's have a double root at 12 so we don't change sign. Let's have a double root at 16 so we don't change sign there either. And let's just have a single root at 24 because that's the end of the interval and we don't even have to worry about changing sign there. So this is the simplest polynomial you could possibly think of. And in fact, it works. That part of what's great about this is the Golay code really wants to be optimal. It wants to be optimal so much that it's not even going to make you do anything hard. You just do the simplest thing that doesn't obviously fail, and it works. So I should say it's not at all obvious that this works because we've only used half the constraints here. The thing is, we have never even checked the coefficients and that they're non-negative, nor have we checked that the bound this gives would actually be sharp if it worked. But you can go through and you know what the Kravchuk polynomials are. They're kind of ugly, but you can write them down explicitly. You can write down the, co the coefficients of f in terms of them. It's a degree six polynomial, so not the prettiest thing in the world, but you can work out the numbers. You can verify that they're all non-negative, and you can see that you've got a sharp bound, and then it works. So on the one hand, this comes across like a miracle, that we didn't do anything to deserve having this bound work. Instead, we just did something sort of hoping that math would be really beautiful and would work out for us. And then math sort of cheerfully obliged and everything worked. This begs for a conceptual explanation. And in fact, Levenstein found one. You can do a more sort of subtle analysis of this and actually explain why this had to work in terms of properties of the Golay code. So this isn't a total coincidence. But on the other hand, you don't even need Levenstein's explanation to see that it works. Basically, what happens here is the LP bound proves a sharp bound, and it does it in the simplest possible way. So I don't want to give you the impression that there's no way of understanding this, but it is kind of miraculous. So the two aspects of this that are so wonderful are, first of all, you get an exact bound that here we wanted to show there were at most 4,096 code words. Now, if you'd happened to prove a bound of 4,096.5, that would have been good enough because code words only come in integer quantities and we could have rounded down to 4,096. So in principle, it would have been enough to get an error of less than one. But in fact, we got an exact bound. It came out to an integer. And furthermore, we didn't just get an exact bound. We found it using the simplest polynomial that doesn't obviously fail. So I should say, this isn't the only way to prove the Golay code is optimal. In fact, there are much simpler proofs. But on the other hand, this is a beautiful one that generalizes to various other codes as well. Questions about anything so far? Okay, so what Noam Elkies and I wondered about some years ago is how this generalizes. In particular, Hamming codes are analogous to E8. In fact, E8 is literally just lifting to things that project down to a Hamming code mod two. And Golay codes are analogous to the Leech lattice. The relationship is slightly more subtle, but it's just a sort of, you know, two epsilon more sophisticated version of this. So you could ask, is there a version of this in Euclidean space that proves that E8 and the Leech lattice are optimal? And of course, we know today the answer is yes, there are. But our hope was that maybe you could solve the sphere problem exactly using a ridiculously simple certificate. And here, it turned out that we were a little bit too optimistic about how simple the certificate would turn out to be. It does, in fact, work in the end. So what we'd like to do is to build a Euclidean analog of this.
So here, a sphere packing is analogous to a code. If we look at the centers of the spheres, the fact that you've got a packing of spheres amounts to saying the centers have to be at least a certain distance apart. So we've got a minimum distance constraint. And the density of the packing amounts to the code size that conventionally one looks at the fraction of space covered, in other words, number of points per unit volume times sphere volume, but it's the same thing up to a multiplicative factor. What's not really obvious at first glance is what is the Euclidean analog of using Kravchuk polynomials? So in hindsight, this turns out not to be so hard, and I'll explain what the analogy is. I should say, at the time, we didn't quite get it, and we arrived at this by a much more elaborate route. What I'll give you is sort of the cleaned up version of what one can see in hindsight. It's not quite how we actually arrived at it. So it'll turn out that Kravchuk transforms play the same role as just the radial Fourier transform here. So what's the point? Remember, we've got an explicit formula for the Kravchuk polynomial. K sub J of I is a sum of a plus or minus sign, minus one to a dot product, over all weight J vectors Y, where we're inputting a weight I vector X. So one way of looking at this is you can look at this Kravchuk transform. In other words, if you take the sum of Cj times Kj of i, you can look at this as a sum over all vectors y of a coefficient depending on the weight of y times this plus or minus one sign, where here the plus or minus one is a character of Z mod two. So in other words, what we're doing here is basically a discrete Fourier transform of a radial function. Here, if you view C as a radial function, in other words, it's a function that only depends on the weight of its input. So what's the analogous thing here? The real variables version of this is instead of summing, we integrate. Instead of summing over the whole discrete space, we integrate over all of Rm. We replace the radial C sub weight of Y with C of Y, where here C depends on only the length of Y. And we replace the discrete character minus one to a dot product with a unitary continuous character, let's say E to the two pi I times a dot product. So this is completely analogous and it gives a Euclidean version of this. And here what we've just got is a continuous Fourier transform. So incidentally, there are two issues you might wonder about. You might say, do we want a plus or minus sign? That's a matter of taste. You might also say, do we really want the two pies there rather than stuck out as a normalizing factor in front? And there the answer is yes, this is where the two pies go. If you like to put the two pies somewhere else, then I have serious issues with your normalization and you should sort of think about it and repent. In any case, this is the good normalization and we'll use it. So what would be an, an, an analog here? So an analog for the Euclidean LP bound would be, let's imagine we have some nice function. We'll make nice precise in a second. Let's suppose it's radial. Our coefficient function C of Y depends only on the length of Y. Let's suppose it's greater than or equal to zero everywhere. And if we define our certificate function by integrating against uh, an exponential, in other words, the coefficients are f hat by Fourier inversion, then f should be less than or equal to zero whenever you're beyond the minimal distance. And the claim is that then you should be able to bound the sphere packing density according to f of zero divided by f hat of zero. Where here, uh, we added this volume factor because that's how people normalize sphere packing density. So this gives us a conjectural uh, analog bound here.
And in fact, Noah Melkes and I uh, proved it. What we showed is for any radial Schwartz function, Schwartz is massively overkill here. You could simplify, you could weaken the hypotheses, but no point in thinking hard. Oops. And any radius r greater than zero, if you impose these inequalities on f, then you get a sphere packing density bound. So I should say again, this is not how we arrived at it, but you can see from this perspective that it's perfectly analogous to the discrete case. Basically, everything is working exactly the same, except you've got a continuous Fourier transform instead of a discrete Fourier transform. And you have some other sort of minor modifications. For example, in the discrete case, there was an upper bound for distance. Distance could, Hamming distance couldn't get greater than n. Whereas in Euclidean space, there's no upper bound for distance, but that's the way it is. So any questions about anything so far? Okay. So a key question here is how on earth can you prove something like this? And the statement may be completely analogous, but the proof requires a little bit of modification. Remember that the problem is in the discrete proof, we had a lot of double sums over all pairs of points. So for example, if you interpret the uh, AI manipulations we did in terms of the code itself, we have a lot of double sums. And the problem is the double sums in the Euclidean case all diverge. So you can sort of formally write down the same manipulations and arrive at the same result, but they're totally divergent and math doesn't love them and nothing works out particularly well. So there's one way of doing getting around this, which is carefully renormalize everything. Yu Fei Zhao and I worked out a proof along these lines, but what Noam and I did was to use Poisson summation. So if you were at Danilo's talk last hour, you'll be familiar with this. Remember what it says is, if you have any lattice in RM, and if you look at the dual lattice, in other words, you take a basis of the original lattice and take the dual basis with respect to our inner product. It's not instantly obvious that that's basis independent, but it's not hard to check that it is. So if you dualize the lattice according to the inner product, Poisson summation says summing f over the lattice is exactly the same as summing f hat over the dual lattice modulo one normalization factor, basically the size of a fundamental domain for the lattice. So remember, this is something Danilo mentioned also, that the way you can understand Poisson summation most easily is by generalizing it. If you take f and you make it periodic mod lambda by summing a bunch of translates, then f is periodic mod lambda, so it's got a Fourier series that's invariant in mod lambda. By the way, there's a missing dual here, which I'll correct in the posted slides. So basically the Fourier series is going to be a sum over the dual lattice of certain exponentials. And they turn out to be proportional to f hat of y. So basically the motivation here is if you just start with Poisson summation in the untranslated form, it's not obvious what to do. But if you add the translation, then you can say, ooh, let's compute a Fourier series using orthogonality to get the coefficients. And then everything just works out. I'll leave this as an exercise. So let's use this to prove the linear programming bound for lattice packing. You can prove it in general using the same idea with a little bit more manipulation, but let's stick to the simplest case for the moment. So let's suppose you have a lattice, and let's suppose you've normalized things so the shortest non-zero vector length is r. Euclidean space is scaling invariant, so you can rescale things however you like. And if you do this, what's the density of your packing? 
Well, if your closest lattice points are at distance r, then the biggest spheres you can fit have radius r over 2. So the density is equal to the sphere volume times the number of spheres per unit volume occurring in space. Here we have one sphere in each fundamental cell. So the density is equal to the volume of a sphere times one over the, air, the volume of a fundamental cell of the lattice. And now, if we have any Schwartz function that satisfies the inequalities needed for the LP bound, we just plug it into Poisson summation. Poisson summation gives us this identity. And on the left side, everything we're summing is non-positive except for f of zero. So we get an upper bound of f of zero. On the right side, we have a lower bound of f hat of zero because all the remaining terms are non-negative. Non and when we combine these, we get a density upper bound of f of zero over f hat of zero. And then we stick in the sphere volume factor. So the proof is very simple with Poisson summation. You just write down Poisson summation and then start throwing away every term you can. In particular, you throw away all the non-trivial terms. So on the one hand, that's throwing away a lot. But what you hope is the terms you throw away are going to be fairly small, hopefully zero in sharp cases. And furthermore, you're throwing away the terms you don't understand. In other words, the terms depending on the lattice, so that what's left is lattice independent and just gives a uniform bound. Any questions about anything so far? Okay, so what do you get out of this? So I've plotted here the numerics in dimensions up to 36. I plotted sphere packing density on a log scale. So what you can see is the lower curve here is the best packing that's known. And you can see that's kind of jagged and difficult to predict exactly. The general trend is clear. It's decreasing exponentially. But it's not clear what the exponential de decay rate is. And it also is sort of jagged and irregular enough that it's not quite clear how to predict what it's doing. But you'll see that it seems to touch in 8 and 24 dimensions. So Noam and I conjectured that this was sharp. In fact, in one dimension, which is not too hard to show, two dimensions, which is still unsolved. We know the optimal sphere packing density, but nobody knows whether it can be achieved this way. And also 8 and 24 dimensions, which now, thanks to Biazovska, are now solved. So how can we get a sharp bound? Complementary slackness applies again. The only way we can get a sharp bound is if the terms we're throwing away all vanish. In other words, f must vanish at all the non-zero lattice points, and f hat must vanish at the non-zero dual lattice points. So these are radial functions. So it's just a matter of which radii you vanish at. And the answer in E8 in the Leech lattice is very simple. You're going to get square roots of even integers, omitting square root of 2 in the Leech lattice case. So schematically, it has to look as follows. In eight dimensions, f should start positive, change sign at root 2, and then have double roots at the bigger square roots of even integers while well, f hat should do the same thing, but never change sign in the first place. So what this is telling us is the behavior you want is determined by what happens at square roots of even integers. Namely, you should have double roots everywhere except f should have only a single root at the place where it's supposed to have a sign change. So what I was originally hoping way back when was that what comes next would be the easy part. Sort of motivated by things like the Golay code, I thought, OK, once we know from complementary slackness what the conditions are, now everything should be very easy. You just write down the simplest thing that can possibly work. And you say, oh, good, it works. QED, we solved the sphere packing problem. <laughs> 
So my hope was that once we reached this point, what was left would be really easy. And I got increasingly distressed about our complete inability to find this function. And at first I was kind of distressed thinking, it can't be that hard to do it. I must just be a complete idiot and somebody is going to point out the one line solution and then I'll feel very foolish for not having found it. But there's a deep reason why this is hard. The thing is that here it really matters that you've got to control both f and f hat at the same time. In the Golay case, we didn't need to worry about this. All we worried about was what does f do? And then f hat just took care of itself and life was good. And that works in the discrete setting, but that completely fails in the Euclidean setting. In the Euclidean setting, taking care of f is not enough. And you've got to worry about f hat as well. And the problem is controlling f and f hat at the same time is fundamentally difficult. This is basically the root phenomenon underlying Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, that when you do something to f, f hat does whatever it wants, and controlling both of them simultaneously is not easy, especially in cases like this where we're trying to control them both simultaneously in a sharp way to get the best possible bound. So basically everyone was stuck until Vyazovska came up with a beautiful idea involving modular forms, solved the E8 case. The same idea extends pretty naturally to the Leech lattice and this settled eight and 24 dimensions. So at this point, we know how to do it in eight and 24 dimensions. Sadly, we still don't know how to do it in two dimensions. I always used to think to myself, gee, you know, two dimensions can't be that hard. Maybe E8 or the Leech Lattice involves some deep magic, but we ought to be able to do it in two dimensions. And maybe if we could do that, we would understand E8 or the Leech Lattice. And I'm sort of surprised that instead, we can now do E8 and the Leech Lattice but it's taking advantage of the fact that the vector lengths are very, very simple in these cases. And the hexagonal lattice A2 has much more subtle and complicated vector lengths, and we still don't know what to do there. So in this case, the best thing happens. Abhinav Kumar, Steve Miller, Danilo Radchenko, Marina Vyazovska, and I eventually proved this. It was a conjecture of Marina's, which I have to admit I didn't believe when she first made the conjecture. It seemed too good to be true, but it is true. It turns out that in 8 and 24 dimensions, things work out remarkably nicely. Remember that what complementary slackness told us was we wanted to control the values and derivatives of f and f hat, by derivative I mean radial derivative, at square roots of even integers. And so it turns out among radial Schwartz functions at least, f is uniquely determined by this information. So this gives us an interpolation theorem saying that this sort of discrete information is enough to uniquely reconstruct the whole function. So you can prove this interpolation theorem using modular forms. I think Danilo will say something about it tomorrow. And it tells us that complementary slackness tells us all the information that's needed to reconstruct the function. So it not only gives us these functions as a special case, but it also lets us prove universal optimality. In other words, the E8 and the Leech lattice minimize all Gaussian energy. So in two dimensions, we know the best sphere packing. That can be done by elementary geometry. But we don't know universal optimality because elementary geometry is not good at dealing with long range interactions. So I find it very frustrating that we still don't know R2. But R2 seems surprisingly deep and delicate. So in particular, there are some fundamental questions we don't understand here. So there's one that I just highlighted. What about R2? And in particular, in every dimension you could ask, 
is there always a universally optimal Euclidean quasi-code in every dimension? So for example, do LP bounds want universal optimality, or is this just a sort of miracle of particular low dimensions? So remember, I told you last time that the discrete analog of this second question is totally false. Starting at block length 12, there are counterexamples. So my initial feeling was, okay, if it's false in the discrete setting, it's probably false in Euclidean space too. And I spent a lot of time trying numerical calculations, trying to find numerical counterexamples, and I've never found one. And I don't know what to make of this. There are at least three possibilities. Maybe my numerical calculations just aren't good enough. Maybe I needed to be trying high dimensions. And maybe it's actually different. Maybe universal optimality always holds at the quasi-code level in Euclidean space. I generally don't know, but I would love to know. And a related question is, do the optimal quasi-codes always correspond to interpolation formulas? And here, I think the answer is yes, except in low dimensions. R2 almost certainly fails for Schwartz functions. In particular, the R2 analog of the E8 and Leech lattice interpolation, trying to reconstruct a Schwartz function uniquely from its values and derivatives, a radial Schwartz function uniquely from its values and derivatives at the A2 vector and dual vector length, just totally seems to fail numerically. So something is deeper in the R2 case, and I don't know how to do it. But meanwhile, I've been talking a lot about carrying over discrete stuff to the Euclidean setting. You could also go back to the discrete setting and say, to what extent can you get things like interpolation formulas for the discrete case in terms of the function in its discrete Fourier transform? And here, this is partially unexplored. There are definitely some things you can say, but we don't have a general theory here. And another question I really think is worth addressing is what happens in high dimensions, either in the high dimensional Euclidean limit, like what I've said here, or in high dimensional binary uh, error correcting codes. There, we still don't know the asymptotics of uh, the uh, linear programming bound. Incidentally, David Delat, uh, Amir Hossein Tajini, uh, Nima Afkami Jetty, Tom Hartman, and I have an explicit conjecture for the limit in Euclidean space. I don't know if I totally believe it, but it seems good given the numerical evidence. Nobody has a similar conjecture in the discrete setting. At the very least, it would be very interesting to have such a conjecture. So let me conclude with a couple of exercises. One is the one I mentioned earlier about proving Poisson summation. And another one is, I think it's really worth convincing yourself that you can solve this in one dimension. It's not too hard, but it's not obvious how to do it. And it's worth thinking through as an exercise. Incidentally, I don't know how to do this with a Schwartz function. So if you can do that, that would be pretty exciting. And meanwhile, I've got a few suggestions for further reading. And uh, incidentally, people who've asked questions in the uh, anonymous forum, I've posted answers to the ones there so far, and I'll try to keep monitoring that. So feel free to use it as a venue for questions or discussion as well. Well, thank you very much, Henry. 